Hello, I'm Avin Jogia. And I'm Erin Westbrook. Welcome to RealWorks. We all have dreams. Our dreams can inspire us to accomplish great things, but they can also be a burden holding us back from embracing life as it is. Filmmaker Alex Casimir is a passionate movie buff who is well on his way to achieving his dream of becoming a great director, but his quest for the happy ending might take some time. Here's Living in Cinema. Wait, what did I say? I asked, what are you doing what I'm doing? I don't know what you are doing, but tell me what I'm doing I'm making this video. So stay tuned, relax, and eat some popcorn. No, don't do that. Please don't. All right, shut the hell up. Let's go. My name is Alex Kazmier and I want to be a director simply because I like making movies. Movies have always provided me with an escape. It's allowed me to act out different lives, different characters, visit new and exciting places. That's where my love stems from. Just being able to be something completely different. One Halloween, I was Darth Vader, and I would keep on reciting lines um, from Empire Strikes Back for, I think, a good whole week, just to, you know, get in character. I learned a lot from movies. I learned how to speak from movies. He's looking at you, kid. My mom uh, was a single mom, and she worked most of the time. So when I was younger, I understood that she didn't really have time to watch over me. One thing she would do to keep me occupied, at least for the moment being, was um, she would have this huge stack of VHS tapes, and one at a time she would pop one in. For the longest time, I felt as if movies were my only form of guidance. Christmas of 2011, my mom bought me a flip camera, and I would record everything. I would bring the flip camera with me to school, or to A26 and I would just film everyone there. I think at some point the camera almost became an extension of me. So I used the camera as much as I could, even for really pointless stuff. What we're doing, part of the challenge of making a movie is when that you walked you wanna... in and you had this like boundless energy and I think that really excited the staff and I, I mean, I, I know that you're being that excited and that enthusiastic kind of motivated us to build programming around that and figure out a way to capture that and um, push it to the extent that we could push it to. You played the like kind of beaten down, uh, emotionally traumatized detective very well. Hey Stella, I got a case for you. I'm listening. There's a kid gone missing on Fifth Avenue. Are you sure this is the right case for me? If it were up to me, you wouldn't even be here. You'll be on traffic duty. Then who's gonna do your dirty work? You made Detective Stiller, he had a lot going on inside. But he didn't, he, you know, he, he was, uh, he couldn't express it all the time. You sat down and you talked about that movie 500 Days of Summer for like, at least 20 minutes. There are not a lot of 10 year olds who would offer up a romantic comedy as an option. Um, and that, I think, was, was sort of like an early indication that you were thinking about 
film making in a different way and that you were maybe thinking about romance in a different way. <laughs> Sleepless in Seattle, 500 Days of Summer, and uh, When Harry Met Sally. A lot of Meg Ryan stuff. In the eighth grade, I had the biggest crush on this girl named Sophia Nalmoli. I actually shot my very first movie with her in the lead role. Really, the only reason why I asked her to be a part of the movie was because I wanted a chance to talk to her. I try to use the logic of romantic comedies in order to, you know, get to know her. And I don't suggest any kid do that ever, or any adult. You know, back then it was hard, and movies were a great way for me to at least get some idea of how a relationship was supposed to be. Did I ever tell you what I thought was gonna happen after uh, we shot like the movie and everything? No. I honestly thought that after we shot the movie, you would become my girlfriend. Why did you think that? I thought that because I thought we actually had a connection, but really I don't. When? Know when? It. Did you feel anything? I don't want to be like mean that person who's like no. But no, I... no, no. It can. I'm. I'm. I'm fine with it. But like no. Take my hand. You complete me. You complete me. <laughs> I hate that. That's Anna. She's smart, beautiful, and she has great taste in music. It's really just anything I could ask for. I didn't really talk to her much, she didn't really talk to me, but I felt like we knew each other. You seem like the girl that would appear in like a romantic comedy. Yeah. Yeah. People tell me that a lot. You fit like an. You fit. Yeah. Because I. People. People. Yeah. People you fit say like. That. I feel like you have that, like almost girl next door esque like personality. <laughs> That's lame. I don't want to be that. <laughs> so there's this thing in Anna Karina now where somebody's talking about the difference between an artist and a dilettante, and he says the dilettante draws his inspiration from other art and the artist draws his inspiration from life. It's better to have your relationship with the world inform what you make than to have your relationship with other movies or other pieces of art. I just imagine, like, you know, kind of a relationship being very, very, very perfect. Being very, well, very yeah, a relationship scenic, like cinematic. Should be perfect. Should it? I yeah. mean, it should have. It should be perfect. I mean, like, there should be, I mean, there shouldn't be problems, but, like, there will be problems, but, like, if it's perfect, then it'll be resolved. Or or at least someone will learn to cope with it the right way. Do you think that defines a perfect relationship? I don't know what defines a perfect relationship because I like, haven't had enough that I would know that. I think some people think I'm a weird guy, and I probably am. I think my obsession with movies can sometimes be a bit unhealthy. Movies have become such a big part of who I am. It's been hard trying to accept that my life can't be something grander. It can't be an epic space odyssey. It can't be a groundbreaking thriller. It can't be a hero's quest. It can't be a romantic love story. Sorry. I said I love the Smiths. My life is sad, awkward, charming, and kind of pathetic. But that's what I am, and that's what I'm going to be. Filmmaker Joey Schweitzer's passion for playing baseball became part of his identity at a very early age. In fact, for a brief moment, it looked like his talent could take him all the way to the top. But was he living his own dream or someone else's? Here's Swinging for the Fences. To me, baseball was everything when I was growing up. Yeah! We win! I mean... You know, I, I absolutely loved it. So I always knew that I wanted to, to, to get you to play baseball. And, because I love baseball. So, and, and we used to have a catch. 
And, you know, I, I thought that you were pretty talented. You know, you could certainly throw the ball and hit. I started playing Little League when I was in first grade, and my dad was the head coach. And I certainly wasn't the best player, but I remember that I had all these friends, and I would always, you know, hang out with them and go over to their houses after games. You know, and we built up a, a camaraderie and, you know, and a, and a friendship that really held our team together and and that's part of the reason why we won that championship in third grade and then after that third grade uh baseball season i started playing on a traveling team called the brooklyn bulldogs um i was asked to coach uh for the summer so i, I asked a couple of the guys uh that i was friendly with who friends of yours and um we, we, we put together, you know, with Eddie, um, a team. I think I was coaching first base and you were the first baseman. And uh, my job as a coach, whether opponent or, or not, is to try to teach. And you were a polite young man over there and we tease each other about winning or how we were playing or if I was doing a good job or if you were doing a good job. You both would walk out of the house so proud, dressed in your uniforms. I thought you enjoyed it, and you liked it. I thought you had friends on the team. I thought it was a positive thing. You were on fire. I mean, hitting-wise, you hit two home runs. You hit two balls out of the park. They probably went about 200 feet. For, for a kid nine years, you know, eight years, nine years old, you were nine, right? That was amazing. I mean, they were shots know what happened we, we I'm trying to figure out you came back from camp um, and your whole throwing motion was different I remember I was in the park and um, you know I was I was uh, having a catch with these other people and then just that one throw so every sport has their injury profile. So soccer players get shin and knee problems, runners get shin splints, swimmers get shoulder problems, and baseball players get shoulder and elbow problems. That's by far the most common injury pattern we see in that sport. And as kids, you know, get more serious and they get older and they grow, um, they put more stress on their shoulder and their elbow. So we see those problems more commonly as they throw harder. And I even felt that they thought, you know, like this was an excuse so I wouldn't have to play. And a part of me was kind of afraid of telling. Uh, it's a level of pressure for a nine-year-old to be out there uh, trying to make plays as a flying rock is hitting their direction. Uh, and, or being on the mound and trying to throw strikes, uh, regardless of how many lessons you've taken or how much you practice. I started from batting seventh to not batting at all, from playing second base to not playing at all. And it's really hard for someone who's so young to experience that because I wasn't on a high school team, I wasn't in college, I was 10. You wanted to tell me the way you were acting couldn't get out of bed, you didn't want to, you didn't want to be bothered, and I just didn't pick up on it, you know. I, I didn't, you know, I thought that if you committed to it, you should play it, but, you know, I was, I was mistaken. I think the harder thing looking back is understanding now, in hindsight, um, how much kids can be hurt uh, by how you interact with them as their talent doesn't grow as maybe the next kid. I thought a team sport was supposed to bring kids together and be socialization, 
and I found for you, um, you weren't friends with these boys. You, you, some of them you didn't like. I, I realized, and this is probably my biggest mistake with you, was that at that point I should have removed you from the organization too. Uh, I should have never let you play. Baseball was, you know, kind of like my identity. They'd be like, oh, Joey, yeah, Joey's on the Bulldogs. You know, like he's, he's a baseball player, that's his thing. And so when I went to middle school, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know like who I was. And it was weird because there was so many people and it was so like overwhelming. And even though I wasn't on the Bulldogs anymore and I wasn't playing baseball, my dad still wanted to have a catch with me. He still wanted to take me to the batting cages. He still wanted to watch the Met games with me. But that desire just ran out. And I don't think he wanted me to become this professional baseball player or anything like that. I think he just wanted me to love baseball. Hey guys, I'm here at Real Works in Brooklyn and I'm lucky enough to be joined by Alex Kazmir and Joey Schweitzer. Alex, of course, was the filmmaker of Living in Cinema and Joey did Swing for the Fences. Um, so I'm very excited to have them here. Thank you guys for being around and sharing your stories with us. I want to just jump right into it. What gave you the idea to, to make these films? Baseball was such like an important aspect of my life uh, growing up, like especially with my relationship with my dad. When I was in the, uh, the documentary film program, I think I realized that I wanted to tell this story about baseball because it's not only about baseball, but it's also about father and son. And it's also about striving for this goal that you're trying to be something great, like trying mm -hmm. to be a great baseball player, mm -hmm. and then coming to the realization that you can't do it because of an injury. You can't do it because you just physically are not able to be a great baseball player. I kind of was inspired to do Living in Cinema simply because I just love movies. And uh, all my life, well, ever since I was nine years old, I always wanted to be a director. Mm. And I think one thing that really inspired me once I came to Real Works is that they provided me with the tools and support in order to make this movie come true. And like throughout the lab, which was the workshop that we mm -hmm. did, they constantly told me, you know, make sure this is your movie and make sure it's a, like it's a personal story. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that there were some difficulties, though, in making these films. What is one difficult thing or what were some difficult things that you had to sort of overcome? The hard thing about like making a movie is that you always want to keep like a certain tone with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something that I was afraid was going to get lost because, mm -hmm. you know, it is a personal story. And, but I feel like in terms of my story, especially in contrast to like a bunch of other real works movies, it's not like the most dramatic like in terms of like what happens in my life. It's just kind of talking about me growing up as like a regular kid in Brooklyn. Mm. So it was me trying to like tell my story with, I did my best to make it like somewhat comedic, mm -hmm. especially with my relationship with like women, g girls, mm -hmm. that was it. <laughs> but you know, I also wanted to make sure that like I'm able to bring it back to earth and you know, talk about how um, so life can't be like a movie mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how hard I try, it just, it just can't. Like, it's real life. Exactly. Yeah. I think that making the movie actually gave me um, a lot of perspective about what I was sort of going through. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, the feelings I wasn't, you know, I didn't even think about them. Like, when you go through a difficult event, you're not really aware of how you felt, I think, till later on. Mm -hmm. I think making, making this film really, really allowed me to reflect on what I was going through. And I think that it was just really helpful for me to get closure. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I grew as a filmmaker. I actually, I had an idea and I set out and I did it. And that's hard a lot of times. Definitely, it is difficult. Alex and Joey, thank you guys so much for being here with us. And thank you guys for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this very special interview with these talented filmmakers. Our final film today revolves around the inner life of filmmaker Nigel Johnson. A homeless student, Nigel's dream world comes to life through two of his passions, drawing and animation. Here's Do You Think. Hey, 
I was partying with my friends. It was cool and chill, because it was like, I'm chilling with the bros, and you know, partying. And I, it was getting late, and I was like, yo, I gotta go, because my mom was gonna start walling out. It was like, all right, yo, see you later, yo. Peace out, yo, get home safe. I'm like, okay. sleeping and then Ron said, um, yo dude, you just gotta chill and like tell your bro dog. <laughs> and he was like, just bring it all out and just chill. And I was like, uh and he was like <laughs> and, then, and then he disappeared. I'm like, mm. I was like, oh man, what the hell? And then Turn off my alarm clock. I felt like sleeping like all day. Like I don't want to go do real life. I want to stay in this life because it's comfortable. I know I'm gonna get like evicted and like I hate coming to school cause like I have to stay home and like some of the schoolwork I miss, I don't understand. Everybody's focused on their work and I, I'm not. And like my grades going down cause of this, this stuff I go through. Again? Yeah. I mean, how many times do you have to be late to my class? She was yelling at me. How am I gonna get you through high school? And then, while he was yelling at me, like, I ain't hear none. I'm like, thinking hard, and I'm like, I should do this story. That would be an awesome story. Like, I was like, yeah, I was like, dope in my mind. Yeah, I just need the music and the animation, all that. I drew on my book, the first picture. I'm like, wow, this is, this is perfect. I was starting drawing since I was five with my dad. When he showed me his drawing, I was like, yo, that's cool. I have my little notebook and like my little hands and my little pencils. And then that's when I got even older and older. I started drawing good. Like I wanted my drawings to move. Oh, we basically, um, I'm drawing the scenes out and then we're gonna scan them and Greg is gonna clean them up and like, hopefully we finish and it will turn out right. Okay. Early this year, my mom was stressed and cause the bills was like piling up. Try to look for a job, try to type in my resume, but I know it's gonna be a waste of time. I tried. I, Tell my mom she understand. Like I felt depressed, like how my family was going through. So, like I didn't want to see nobody. I just wanted to go up and move. I know it was raining, it was dangerous, but like I didn't care. Ask myself why I'm here, why I'm born here. I don't want to be here. I hate this place. The day I got evicted and I was skating in the rain, she texted me to say, come home. I was like, man, I knew this was gonna happen. It was 
was just rain, moving slow. I was like, you don't have to be afraid to tell your story. And people look down on you. That don't mean nothing. They they just don't see what's in you or in them too. Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on RealWorks.